Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining my, my uh, live stream. My name is Artem. And I will talk today a little bit about ego and how it relates to society. I'll try to make it quick because I will, I want to actually, I want to leave as much time as possible uh, for discussion, for people to ask questions and, you know, speak about their own experience or uh, ask for guidance and things like that. But I would like to talk about ego. It is very hard to understand what ego is. It is strictly speaking not possible to understand what ego is before you see it for the very first time. And in, in my terminology, uh, the uh, verbiage that I use, right? Those are just words, concepts. I mean, different people use different words and it's okay. It doesn't matter. But what I refer to the moment of self-realization is the moment when you see your ego for the first time. And once you really see ego for the first time, it's not possible to unsee it. So that's why authentic self-realization is a point of no return. So then you are, after this happens, then you know, uh, you identified with something that was not real, that was false, and you know that you're on the path and, and you cannot go back to uh, getting lost in the dream completely. So uh, various, you know, uh, momentary uh, insights and profound spiritual experiences, you know, which people can described as Satori or uh, Kensho and things like that. Uh, at that point of time, you kind of still don't know what ego is. And uh, so uh, uh, Satori experiences, they are uh, important because they leave you absolutely doubtless with regards to that there is something more uh, uh, to reality than uh, how you have been experiencing it. So from this perspective, they are important and beautiful, but but Satori is not Samadhi. So as Osho used to say, Satori is a, is, is a fake Samadhi, and, and it's true. But but uh, so, uh, so it's hard to define what ego is uh, until you see it for yourself. And moreover, uh, what it actually is kind of changes as you go through the path, as you go through the unfolding, how you see ego also changes. But the most important thing to remember, I think, for all people, you know, for, for, the, for the seekers of truth, for people who had satori experiences or for people who are self-realized and uh, on the path to, uh, to enlightenment for anybody, the most important thing to remember is that ego is a social creature. It's not your body. And uh, it loves to confuse you. It loves to pretend that it's the body. Uh, it is simply a part of you which is utterly concerned with how other people see you. And it's utterly concerned with how you see yourself, because this is one and the same thing. So it is a part of you that is invested in your self-image, 
that is invested in how you think of yourself, how you want to appear, what you want other people to think of you. And as a consequence, every time life doesn't flow in accordance to the investment that has been made in the mind with regards to what you are, who you are, how it should be for you, then it, it suffers. So ego cannot exist in isolation. It cannot exist when it's completely alone. As, as soon as you uh, surrender to your aloneness, as soon as you become alone, as soon as you uh, start meditating in solitude, for example, then it starts to suffer because it needs to be seen, it needs to be acknowledged, it needs to be validated. The seeing, and it, it could come from other people, the seeing and validation could come from other people, it could come from yourself, is the very basis of its existence. So it is related to uh, all the other people uh, in a myriad of social ties. And the, the most interesting thing about ego is how it comes to be because uh, we as species we live in a profoundly sick and cruel society and everything that ego does is ugly you know, ego has nothing to do with your true desires, with your wants, with your needs. I, I don't mean emotions, but, uh, you know, food, shelter, and things like that. With uh, what it is that you enjoy doing in life. Every great work is a work of love. You know, the best people in any field, any field, love what they do. You know, they love the uh, creative process. Uh, they love uh, building something or um, making something better. Or they love helping other people. They love, you know, saving people's lives. And if, if it's a surgeon, we're talking about whatever it is you do, uh, you can do it out of love or you can do it out of obligation. So uh, ego isn't always related to what you do in life, you know, not at all. But it is very deeply related to how you view yourself and how you view other people. And as we grow up, you know, because our society is profoundly unwell. You know, so most people, uh, they do live their lives in a dream, egoic state, and they have a lot of uh, suppressed suffering. They have a lot of judgments, and they are almost always cruel. So they can be outwardly cruel to other people. They can be inwardly cruel. To themselves, you know, ego needs to compare itself to other people, to other egos, right? Because it can only exist in comparison. The biggest ego's question is, how do I compare to them? You know, who am I compared to them? Because the question, who am I, without making any comparisons, is absurd. If you are the only being in existence, then you cannot uh, ask yourself, who am I? It, it, it doesn't matter. And I'm not trying to suggest that I'm the only being in existence. I mean, the, the kind of I'm completely alone is also not completely alone. It's also just a stage. I, I mean, it is true in a sense, but, but in, other true, in other sense, it, it's not true. But uh, uh, the, the part of, of psyche, the part of mind that holds the psychological image, that holds, the, uh, you know, it, it is psyche in a way, but uh, 
that can be described as ego is utterly concerned with how it compares to other people on all sorts of characteristics, you know, including good, bad, kind, you know, loving, hateful, beautiful, ugly. Uh, so our society is a society of uh, of competition, right? So we we de departed from from nature uh, to very large extent because. From the perspective of nature, we are very simple creatures. You know, we we aren't much different from any animals. You know, we we need food, we need shelter, we need warmth, and if that things are satisfied, then just as other as any other animal, we are happy, content, peaceful, and everything else. Creativity, you know, building something, uh, creating new things helping other people, all of that. It, it is, it is on, on top of this very basic, very simple reality. But that's not the reality of the ego. Because, because in our society, from the very early childhood, people evaluate you. People judge you. People compare you. People give you all sorts of signals and messages about how they want you to be. What is proper behavior? What is improper behavior? What is good emotion, which is considered to be desirable when you show it? Everyone is cheered by your presence. What is a negative emotion? What you should not show to other people? You know, with what emotions you should go alone? You should go away. You know, anger, tears, resentment, bitterness, nobody likes that. So uh, regardless of how you really feel, uh, you are trained to be a certain way. And, and gender is also a big part of it. I mean, gender is, is actually a, a very good example because, because it's kind of obvious, you know, like we all know on some level that... Uh, women and men are socialized differently, you know? Like, it is considered less proper for girls to be aggressive or angry, and it's considered less proper for men to be weak and, and cry and, and things like that. And therein lies a profound cruelty. Because as you suppress your natural... Uh, emotional response as you suppress your 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 natural being and it happens very it starts to happen very quickly then you start to unconsciously assume the role that people in your uh, vicinity you know uh, and then later it expands to, I mean, it starts from parents, but it expands to peers and larger society and TV and everything. So you, you start to assume the role that people in society expect of you to play. That kind of fits you. And then you forget that you assume this role. So you identify it. It becomes you. It becomes the core of your identity. And all the suppressed suffering, all the pain is under, under it. And as you play this role, uh, as you know, new situations arise where your natural reaction contradicts your role how you think you should react in this situation, how you think you should behave, what you think is proper in this situation. Then you suppress more and more and more. And you kind of accumulate the suffering from, from childhood. Uh, and if it's a lot, then it will find its outlet sooner or later, you know. And that is the source of egoic cruelty, because if you suffer inside, then you also want to bring suffering to other people. And 
the violence, the physical violence, the intolerance, you know, including very tolerant people who are tolerant to everybody except the intolerant ones, uh, is a manifestation of uh, uh, egoic uh, suffering. It's, uh, it is an, an aggression that is uh, projected outwards, you know, if, if directed outwards. So if it's, if it's directed inwards, then people usually get very depressed, and people get suicidal and, and, and things like that. So, um, so spiritual awakening, you know, whatever, like even a Satori moment, uh, whatever it is, but, but the beginning of the spiritual path can be said to be the point in time where you make a 180 turn, you know, when you no longer accumulate when you want to shed, when you no longer go away from you into the role, when you stop being concerned with how you play in your role, when you stop being concerned with how other people see you and you start authentically loving yourself and you start being concerned with yourself, with what you feel, and you start being truer to yourself, more authentic with yourself. And that is how you ultimately transcend ego, because you cannot get rid of anything, you can only love it. You cannot get rid of ego, you can only accept it. In acceptance, it disappears. In allowance, it dissolves, because it's nothing but a deep well of suppressed suffering which you carried with you since long, long, long time ago, because your ideas about how to live your life, how to behave, what to think, uh, were all borrowed. And uh, another characteristic of, of an ego is that it is almost pretty much constantly in some sort of pain. And we are so used to it, you know, we're so used to it that we don't even pay attention to it, you know, because, and everybody is, is like that around us, right? So, so we think it's entirely normal. And, and it is normal in a way that is statistically normal. But it's not normal in a way that it's not natural. And when ego is in pain, when, when you are in pain, when you experience a negative emotion, when you feel insulted, when you feel diminished, when you feel unappreciated, when you feel invalidated, when you feel triggered, uh, whatever it is, then when ego feels pain, its knee-jerk reaction is to assign blame to someone else or to yourself even, it doesn't matter. But it needs to find a culprit. It needs to, to find uh, a reason for the pain. And then a defensive reaction is to invoke pain onto that person. So it is an irrational behavior, but it's very hard to see it this way. Because uh, let's say someone uh, uh, makes you angry, and you are utterly convinced that this person is at fault, and uh, he made you angry, and you get angry back at them, right? So the reason you're doing this, like the, the, the deep reason you are shouting and screaming at this person is you want to communicate to them that you don't like getting angry and you want to kind of correct them or fix them so that they don't make you angry anymore, right? Because if it wasn't unpleasant for you, if it wasn't a bad experience for you to get angry at this person, then you wouldn't care, right? You wouldn't shout and scream at them or you wouldn't have a conflict with them. The, the very source of conflict is that you hope that in fixing them, 
you will get less of the anger. So this leads to a, a very irrational kind of circle of violence and and uh, and pain, because the reason people invoke pain onto other people emotionally I mean, uh, is to experience less pain themselves. So ego by always running away from itself, by always by living in pain, but at the same time, always trying to avoid its pain, it perpetuates its own existence and it perpetuates its own violence. And all that's needed is to kind of stop pedaling the bicycle, you know, and, and, and surrender to your own pain. Uh, be open to experience more. Because beyond, behind every pain, uh, behind every tear, behind every wave of fear, there is more love, peace, and beauty. But we are so afraid, we are so scared to go there that we employ all sorts of tricks in order to not experience uh, the suffering. And that is the biggest uh, ego trick, the biggest uh, issue on the road to spiritual awakening and to, to you know, awakening, enlightenment, self realization, whatever is the avoidance of uh, your own pain and seeking pleasant experiences uh, as, as a distraction from uh, discontent. So I think that's enough of me talking. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, and I would like to open it up to questions and discussion. I don't have any comments. So I'm just going to add people who are in the waiting room uh, in the order that they appeared. Okay, boom. Hello. Oh, I'm so sorry. Hello. Hi, hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. Yes. Can you hear can me? Hear. I, I can hear you. I can hear you too. Okay. Okay. You are um, live. Please ask your question or whatever it is. Oh. I didn't expect to be the first person, actually. I wanted you to. You actually watch. were. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to watch. OK, so should I, uh, like, Yeah, speak? put me down. OK, no, well, I mean, I'm, I'm going to. Put me down. Then. Put you down. <laughs> Hello, Justin. Hello. Can you hear me? Hi, Justin. Yes. All right. Here I am. Hey. Hi. Um, so I guess I do have a question. Sure. Uh, and it goes pretty well with what you're talking about. Um, for me, it's I've been having some... The biggest problem right now is I've been having a lot of trouble with anger and frustration. And you're saying, like, um, we're angry with other people and we show them emotional violence to prevent our own pain. And being a high school teacher and I'm being kind of a, I don't know, trying to, I feel like I, I'm constantly worried that I'm just um, like conditioning the next generation. And like, I'm just worried, like even like, even like grading their papers, it's like, oh, well, I'm telling this kid, you failed this, you're not good enough. And so that's, that's one part of like my problems um, teaching is like, I, I don't know how to avoid, I don't know, being a just, I don't know, kind of the role I play in my life kind of, I don't know, it's just okay, very yeah. easy to condition to me. 
I understand. So, so, so there are two things here, right? And and one is your own anger, and and one is your own frustration, and another is your concern about how, you know, yeah. not to condition kids. Yeah, they're that. they're different. I so it. so, uh, yes. I mean, you need to allow yourself to be angry, but it doesn't mean that you must uh, express your anger, right? So. Uh, it is to some extent unavoidable, you know, it is not possible to not be emotionally violent uh, until you see all the sources of your emotional violence, until you see yourself, until you go through all the anger, through all the fear, through all the frustration, through all the tears, right? And even then some people might think you're emotionally violent but you would have no intention to harm them. But uh, the intention that we have to harm people in our speech, uh, in our conduct, uh, I mean, emotionally, I expect y you don't harm people physically. <laughs> but the, the intention, you usually don't see it uh, until it's still there. Well, when, when you start seeing it, that's when it also becomes very unpleasant and you can kind of get, you know, very disgusted at yourself and, and things like that. But that's, but that's okay. You know, that is, that is totally fine. You cannot let go of anything before you see it. Right. So, so of course, you know, try not to be uh, violent. Of course, try not to say nasty things. Of course, absolutely. But when it happens, don't blame yourself for it, you know. So uh, the acceptance is inner acceptance, right? You have to be, you have to accept your inner anger. And uh, um the deeper you accept the anger, the more of it you experience, the more you get tired of it, the more accepting you become of other people for uh, how they are, the uh, less control it will have over you, the, uh, the less it will pull your strings, right? So all of those things like anger, pain, disappointment, frustration, envy, what have you, they tend to kind of control you in a way, right? And it is always the avoidance of some unpleasant experiences, always the avoidance of this uh, uh, emotional experiences that is the goal, right? So when somebody makes you angry, you know, uh, you know, I mean, you are a teacher, you are a rational person, you know perfectly well what is an inappropriate response and what is appropriate response. And and you know that, you know, it's stupid to like scream at your student at school or, or whatever. And, and, and you know that, right? But uh, do not try to suppress the emotional experience, you know, so, so, uh, Sometimes, of course, you know, if you're doing work, it's hard. I mean, that's why it's very hard to go through this process. It's very hard to go through this process while still working. You know, there, these emotions, they can completely overwhelm you. Uh, but you go home, you know, you meditate or you think about something that happened the, the other day. Uh, allow yourself that anger as it, as it arises in you, as you feel... Uh, the anger or frustration, you know, don't run away from it. Uh, feel it. Feel it. There is nothing wrong with with you because you feel it, right? So, so uh, of course, it can be very challenging, uh, you know, to try not to uh, spill on people this newfound level of your own negativity. It's the same experience with for everybody. It was the same experience for me. And I did it, you know, and I did spill it onto some people uh, quite uh, consistently, I might add. I mean, 
So, so, so it's normal. Uh, it, it's okay. And with regards to... Uh, can I comment on that real quick? What was that? Uh, can I comment on that real quick? For sure. The other thing? So, sure. yeah, I think, um, I think I've been seeing that a lot. I think I've been seeing the truth in that a lot because I have... I spent the summer, the good thing about being a teacher is you get three months off to kind of process everything. Um, I spent the summer accepting a lot of those emotions. And the first month and a half this year was my best time teaching because I was able to ex like accept like frustration, and, like just the fear in my gut, the anger. I was, ex I was able to do that. And I've, I've become so much closer to the students. And honestly, like I'm, I'm saying like I'm, I get angry still, but I probably still way much, less. Much less, right. Way less, yeah. Um, but yeah, I guess I guess I just need to keep doing what I'm doing. It's just that at some point I got so I started accepting so much of that anger and so much of that frustration and fear that it it just was too painful to keep it all. Yes, and, and yes, like, certainly. And, and those moments may still come. It feels yeah. like too much. And, and it's okay. But you but you have certainly noticed that the less and the less anger as a response comes up, the more uh, compassionate and calm you can be in your uh, response in your action towards the students, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. for sure. so, so it is it is important to allow yourself to to experience it to allow yourself to work through it to allow yourself uh because it's totally it's completely normal to be angry you know uh, especially as you're seeing a lot of lies in society so but with regards to you know your uh concern about um uh, you know, not conditioning in people. I would say, drop this concern. Okay. You know, drop it, because you cannot do it uh, deliberately. You know, if you do it deliberately, if you think, "Oh, what should I say not to condition this person anymore?" Then you will be harming this person because you are still doing it from a position of ego from a position of narcissistic self adoration like how do i be a good how do i not uh harm them you know how do i make things for them that would be pleasant for them you know oh i don't want to like give them grades because it because they will feel judged and stuff like that you actually might be hurting people with with this you see the, the conditioning doesn't work like this, right? So not everything is, is, is a judgment, you know? If two kids, uh, uh, I don't know, are in a sports competition or whatever, or, or they like jump and, and, and one kid, kid jumps much further than, than another one, you know, it, it is absurd to, to assume that uh, there is no winner, no loser. They're all the same and give everybody the medal. This is horrible. This actually uh, uh, nurtures ego, you know? <laughs> but, but what is also uh, absurd is to treat them differently as human beings after that, you know? What's also absurd is to be cruel to the loser or to put a winner on a pedestal, or to think a winner is now a better human being, or he has more value, or anything like that, you know? But if you jumped, if you jump is much shorter than the next guy, it's a fact of life, you know? It's the ego that loves to live in fantasies about how it should be treated and how uh, everyone uh, must be equal. I mean, we are equal. We are absolutely equal as as individuals, right? But it doesn't mean that we're not different, you know? So the conditioning, the true cruelty of society is not uh, that everyone has different abilities and everyone uh, uh, pours their energy into different directions and they have different interests and, and as a consequence, they excel in different things. 
That's not cruelty. The cruelty is aggression, is emotional and physical violence, you know. It's when the kid with an F comes home, right? And the mother or father says something like, oh, Jesus, just look at good for nothing or something like, oh, I knew nothing would come out of you or something like that, you know, or whatever, whatever it is. Like you can come up with all sorts of cruel remarks that are designed to put down a person, you know. So, so obviously, you know, if somebody gets an F and, and gets upset about it, you know, then of course you can console them. Like there's nothing to be upset about. Maybe you should put effort, maybe you should put more effort next time. Or maybe it's not that important for you. You know, what, what like, like it's, uh, you know, there's, there's all sorts of things that you can do to support people without being violent to them. The most important part of this egoic judgment is that if you conform to the society standards, this is somehow makes you less of a human being. It makes you worse. And it is insanely callous, you know, and yet we do this all the time to each other. And, uh, and that's pretty much, you know, all, all, all you can do. So treat every kid as a, as a human being with their own struggles, with their own desires. I mean, some might not want to be in school at all, but they, they're made to be, you know, and because they don't have a choice, you know, and it's understandable. They might not care about any, you know, the subject that, that you teach you. Does it mean you have to give them an A? No, but, but does it mean that you can be compassionate and understanding of their uh, position in life? Well, of course you can be. You know, you can try to be. And uh, I mean, some like your subject, you know, try and fail. You know, they need your uh, uh, support and, and, and uh, uh, acknowledgement and uh, the word that I was looking for. Um, I forgot. Anyway. Yeah, so, so uh, there is a... Uh, objective truths of life, right? And then there is judgment. There is judgment, you know. If, uh, of course, schools are cruel. Yes, schools, schools are very cruel. I mean, but they're not cruel because uh, there are, there are uh, tests uh, that test knowledge. I mean, a, a lot of them don't test knowledge very well, as, as I'm sure you're well aware. Like they test memory and things like that, but they don't test understanding. Uh, but they are cruel because they are uh, mandatory, right? So regardless of what you want to do as a kid, you need to go there and you need to study this. You need to study this regardless of what your interests are, and we're going to measure and evaluate you. And there's all sorts of shaming uh, mechanism and your parents are going to be not happy with you uh, if you don't perform well and things like that. And, and this is, of course, cruel, you know, but uh, uh, you kind of have to decide, you know, you, you want to fight the whole system, then the position of a teacher is not a very good position, right? You have to like become then, you know, a uh, educational system reform activist and, th and things like that, right? So in, in the position of a teacher, uh, uh, the most important thing is, the, is that you don't add on to this judgment, you see, that you, that you understand, uh, that, that you uh, uh, treat them as individual uh, human beings. Yeah, the uh, what you're talking about with like it being mandatory and um, like they can't leave and all that. I'm one of the enforcers of all those things, and I see through it. Like I see that. Well, I I just I don't agree with it. I see that like um, I see that it's, it's silly that it's mandatory in some ways. Like it's it's there are some students who being at school is not the right thing for them right at the moment, but like part of my job to enforce rules, to enforce all of these Oh, things. yes. I mean, this is your situation. Part of your job is to enforce these rules, right? Yeah. Yes. And, no, that's and, where so much just 
fighting in my brain. Yes, yes, yes. I, I, I completely, completely understand, right? But it's a trade-off, you, you know, right? So, uh, of, of course, uh, right? I mean, imagine uh, a prosecutor, for example, who uh, helps uh, find and prosecute criminals. And I'm not even saying that our rehabilitation system is a good system. It's horrible. You know, prison is, is a horrible, horrible uh, thing to do to a person. This is not how you, how you rehabilitate a person. It's, it's extremely cruel. And, 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 and those people need more understanding, of course. But, but, but imagine that you're in this position and then you have to prosecute something that you don't even consider a crime, like deeply, you know, because it's, it's victimless and, and stuff like that. But you have to do it. It's part of your job. Your uh, choice then is to either leave this job or do this lesser evil and stay on this job for a greater good. You know, so it's the same thing with you, right? For as long as you think that what you're doing is good, because, you know, you're spreading knowledge and things like that. Yes, the system will compel, will make you do things that you don't agree with. And that's true. But, you know, where while you're within the system, you kind of have to uh, decide for yourself if you want to make a peace with it and do it because it's a great good. Or you want to leave the system completely. You want to leave the school. You, you want to you, and, and, and contribute some other way. You know, I would say personally, I don't know if it, now this is my personal opinion, you know, but 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 I would say that uh, that in our schools, uh, I, I actually I wasn't raised in the US, so I'm talking about uh, I'm 42 years old and I was raised in Russia, so it's another country and it's like 30 years back. But back then, there were almost no good teachers in school, they were all very judgmental, very emotionally violent, and they treated us almost like slaves. And I'm sure it's it's it better in, in the US. Uh, but but uh, uh, I mean, regardless of your level of spiritual attainment, whatever, you know, this this thing is going to continue for some time. You know, and I think we need more compassionate people in school, more people who are understanding, more people who can touch the students, not only with knowledge and discipline, but with uh, heart, love and understanding. And I mean, if you're in this position, you will have to do things you, you disagree with. Well, well, sure, sure. Yes. You know, so it's a question for you to answer. You know, it depends on what you want to do. What what brings you pleasure, how you want to contribute. So would you mind if we switch to another person for now? Sounds good. Okay. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Okay. Hi, Xavi. Hi. Sorry, I don't have any question. I'm just watching. <laughs> Okay, seven, next one. Bye. Hi, Luca. Uh, hi. So I'm um, currently at that state where I see that I'm witness, that I can't do anything, that I just perceive everything, that I mean, thoughts, emotions, whatever. And Wait. I feel in some way meaningless to do anything. Surrendering means like... Um, I think that I have problems understanding what no, it right. exactly it's means. Yes, 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 you have to do. Um, I mean, <laughs> at this stage, you see, it's not about what you can do, but it's about how well can you do nothing. How <laughs> yes. well can you do nothing? You see, because. Uh, you know, being witness is still like a stage. There's still more for you, but 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 there's nothing to do. <laughs> but if you meditate, right? When you meditate, and then things arise, right? There is energy rising in the body, kundalini experiences, whatever. Is there some visuals? There's some emotional experience. If you can meditate and and then you can cry afterwards and things like that, you know, then. Uh, me, then this is a practice of doing nothing, right? Then there's still some restlessness, there's still some suffering, there's still some, which is why I say, for as long as meditation arises something in you, 
that's it's good practice. If you can meditate for like an hour and absolutely nothing happens, you know, there is there is no bodily changes, there is no kundalini energy, no visuals, no emotions. Like no, you just like okay, I was just I just just lying here. Like fuck, that's boring, you know. But I mean, you're an expert at doing nothing, and you can do anything you want. You know, like like the the problem isn't that you know you have to do nothing. Is that is that if you are unable to do nothing, how can you be free, right? If you're unable to do nothing, then you're still pulled, right? I mean, even in a situation where you have food, you have shelter, you have nothing to worry about, but there's you lie down and there's restlessness, you know? So, uh, so you can just relax, you know, or you can keep practicing. You can try meditation. You can try a uh, low dose of psychedelics, which could also like in improve significantly your, your meditation experience. But, but uh, there is uh, there is obviously more to see of yourself, more to accept of yourself, right? But but generally speaking, once you started witnessing, it, it's a uh, it, it's a process that doesn't. It's an irreversible process. Yeah, it's hard to somehow stop doing whatever I want. It's not like I want something. It's just like it's hard to go back and say something to me like I did before. Oh, it's not right. I'm right. Yes, yes. It's a taste of freedom, right? So basically, what you are saying is like anything I can do is like meditate and that's and take low doses of psychedelics. So, so, so there's a levels of well-being, right? So this whole path is about your well-being. It's about your your. Uh, it's about a journey into the state of the ultimate peace, serenity, happiness, and more importantly, freedom. And there are a lot of things on the path. There's there's suffering. There's universal love. There's emptiness. There's all sorts of experiences for the mind that you go through and let go of ultimately. But uh, the, the biggest value of life is freedom, right? So yes, I mean, you uh, learn to do what it is you want. And meditation uh, is also part of it, right? So do you, do you want to go faster, deeper? Do you want to see more? Do you want to experience more? Do you want to see all the other things, all the other strings that, that are pulling you? more tears in you, more bondage in you, you know? Do you want to go deeper and deeper into the dissolving into existence, into the freedom? Then yes, meditate and you're gonna love it, you know? At first I thought that it's like some unhealthy type of dissociation, but it's very I think calm, that yeah. it's like, yeah, that I should go on and on it's not like unhealthy type suppression no 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 no. yeah you should go deeper and you can go on and on and and that's that, that okay. that's totally fine it's it's an it's it's a necessary shift of identity you see so the identity shifts from the ego which which is what what you thought you were right so you thought you were this dude in your head that was talking <laughs> right <laughs> yes. yes no you're not that Right, so 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 you need to jump into the observer first, right? Into the witness. So so, and this is absolutely healthy. This is absolutely normal. I mean, at time you can get lost again, and and at times and think you're this dude again. But when that happens, just don't try to go back. Just just, just don't do anything, and uh, just just stay stay as it is. It will naturally go back. But this witness is also it's a temporary identity also it also will need to be uh, transcended but it's an important identity because ultimately you is just you i mean you will understand it later at the end of the path because you is just you you're not the ego you're not witness you know, it's just you. <laughs> but the witness can be said to be the one to be the necessary intermediate step an identity that is witnessing that is observing the false that is observing the ego, you see, and into that observer, into that witness, it dissolves. You need to see something before you let it go, you know, 
you need to experience suffering before you let it go. You need to see your patterns before before you let it go. So you're witnessing. You're witnessing your thoughts. You're witnessing your emotions. You're witnessing. And and the and uh, the more of experience you allow, uh, the uh, deeper you will see your kind of composition. You know, <laughs> and the composition is also what binds you. This this is the bondage, you know. All of your beliefs about yourself, about how you should be and behave in, 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 in different situations, what will bring you happiness, what makes you miserable, all of that. Right. So 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 it's really, I mean, I would I, I it's good, yeah. And practice will intensify it, it will make it faster. That's that's all it is. Because um, you know, a lot of people after they become you know the witness. They they don't do anything, and 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 it's totally fine. They they, they enjoy the state of they enjoy. It, it doesn't matter in the end, you know how much of it you go through uh, in life. But, but uh, for some people, it tends to unfold relatively quickly and relatively deeply. For some people, it, it doesn't. But the deeper you go, the deeper uh, you know. Peace, serenity, and well-being uh, you experience, right? And, and there's some fear on the way too. And there will be more fear in you. So if you just stepped out to be the witness, then there will be much more fear. Uh, and that's fine. You see, I mean, you uh, and if you have nothing to fear but, but yourself. <laughs> So do you think maybe is it productive to smoke pot, uh, weed? Because it some, sometimes make me paranoid. So yes, that's I don't know whether it's like that's the fear. Uh, so yeah. I personally think that it can be very productive, right? But it depends on. Uh, so so look at what's happening when, when you do that, right? So I can tell you a little bit about about my experience with with weed. So 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 when I especially in. Uh, like now, it's 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 somewhat different. It's, it's it's much milder. I mean, it's the same thing, but just like very 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 mild. But but before, uh, like a year and a half ago or something, that if I, I could I could smoke a little bit, and there would be yes, there would be there would be a fear. There could be some visual host. It was just basically like like a mini LSD trip. So there could be fear, there could be uh, visual hallucinations, there could be mind racing and things like that. But there also came insights, you know, and uh, they don't come during the uh, resistant resistance uh, stage of the trip or like mid trip on on, on weed, or, because it usually doesn't last long. No, this is just fear. The mind's madness, the rumination, the emotion, the resistance, and everything. They they come later, you know, because because later as you go through this and you find yourself, it is okay. So the mind is quieter now. Uh, there, there's you know more sensitivity with regards to your your senses, and and the mind might still be thinking of the insights might come, and the authentic insights. They almost never come in in the like bad part of it. They come either in the plateau part of it, or even better, they come later, like you know, a day later, or or or, or, or something like that. And the authentic insights, uh, they come and they they stay. You know, it's never just a thought. It's oh my god, this is true. This has always been true. It's <laughs> obvious. I just it's always true. How could I not know this? How could I forget this? That's an authentic insight. You will never, like, for example, uh, even the the insight, like my, I can tell you from my own experience, that the insight that I will never experience death. It's not something that you, it's possible to experience. That I can only experience life, right? Even until the very end of life, it's going to be life. You know. And all fear of death is in reality the fear of life. It's the same thing. The death is not something that you can experience. Is it came to me on uh, weed actually, but again, not in the bad part of it, right? I mean, I mean, uh, I was I was very normal. Uh, I, I was just sitting and just watching the clouds and and. Uh, 
there was a maybe slight uncomfortableness and and the mind and there were some passing thoughts in in the mind and 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 then and then it hit me you know so it uh uh it is not in the kind of psychedelic visual weird parts of, of the trip where insights come i mean this is just going through egoic madness you know they come later you know so uh kind of uh, i mean psychedelics are just meditation uh forced meditation basically so you can try it with you, you can try to combine it with meditation or you can try it by by yourself yes but but uh, they do tend to uncover more fear and and suffering and pain and as you go through them uh, authentic rememberings authentic insights happen and if it's authentic if it stays you know if it's just a crazy thought during the trip you know no i mean authentic insights is it's always been like this you see because it's a remember <laughs> it's not oh i didn't know this now now i know this no it's always I always knew this. How could I have forgotten it? That's an authentic insight, right? And yes, it can come on. Absolutely. Just like an LSD. You know, but it, but it doesn't happen, you know, when people say, oh, psychedelics are very, very bad for spiritual growth. No, they, they're talking about like the trip part, the kind of crazy part, same part, the anxious part, the hostage. There's nothing authentic there. No, later. Later. When, when it's integrating, when you calm, when the mind is more quiet, sometimes even a few days later, you know. So, uh, so yes, it can be a useful tool. So just, you know, look at uh, how you feel. Uh, see w what, is, what is happening within you when, when you're doing this. Uh, and I, I, it certainly can be a, a good tool. For sure, for sure. Uh, so, may I switch to another? Let's person? switch to another person. Yeah, it's fine. Thank okay. you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Luca. Thank you. Uh, Sam. Hi. I was just listening. I don't have any question. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Right. Okay, so I have a comment on Facebook. This is such a great uh, broadcasting tool. So, boom. So, uh, Ramandeep Tarkal says, in a no-mind state where there are minimum to non-noticeable ego slash self-referential thought, I feel very cold or numb. Not many feelings at all. I don't like or care for people anymore. What is happening? In no-mind state, you become like a state. Like a stone. Well, yes. 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 You do kind of become like a stone. So that's also what, what, what Osho meant when he said, in, in my vulnerability, I became invulnerable. Yes. Yes. So as I said in the beginning, you know, ego is a social creature. So all the emotions are... Uh, a product of relationships and all the relationships are a, product, are a product of how do I want to be seen? How do I want other people to see me? How do I want to see myself? Not what I want to do at the current moment. Not, not, they're not a product of freedom. They're a product of ties. They're a product of bondage. And even compassion is in a way bondage. You know, because the ultimate freedom must include Freedom to help people or not. Freedom to, uh, you know, enjoy your life just as an ordinary person or become a teacher. I mean, even, even that is, is a very important part of freedom. And how can you say uh, that you have this freedom if you are constantly pulled emotionally into uh, other people? So yes, yes. I mean, an authentic, deep realization in buddhahood you do feel cold but that allows the highest compassion and understanding to manifest 
because the true love can only be called. Passion in love is always unacknowledged hatred. For if someone can make you feel good, they can also make you feel bad and you will hate them for it. You just won't admit it, but you will. You know? So to know cold love is very significant. You know, it is very, uh, a very significant uh, milestone on the journey when you start to get the glimpses, when you start to understand cold love. Because love is not what you feel to another person. No, love is what you do. So if other people influence you for better or worse, now then your ability to be loving to them, not to feel loving or to think you're loving, but to, to be loving, to behave in a loving way towards them is lessened. So, so it, is, it is a paradox that in, in coldness, in surrender, you are becoming utterly accepting and, and loving. Only when nothing bothers you, you can be uh, accepting. And, uh, uh, you know, it usually, it, it doesn't, like, you have glimpses of, of the state, right? So, but, but to, to, to live, like, to know true love, uh, which is also emptiness, and to live in true love uh, are kind of different, right? So usually it starts with knowing it, with, with having glimpses of it, but there's, there's still, there's more and more, and, and as a kind of, as you said, minimum to non-noticeable. So as it kind of uh, quiets down, you get deeper and deeper into that uh, acceptance and surrender and, and equanimity and, and serenity. So, so, so yes, I mean, it, it does feel this way, oftentimes initially, as, as you sing. And, uh, but, but there's a tremendous beauty in it, right? There's a tremendous beauty in freedom. There's a tremendous beauty in, in your body. There's a tremendous beauty in understanding uh, uh, compassion and love, even cold compassion and love, intellectual uh, compassion and love uh, to other people. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a tremendous uh, uh, beauty in it. Uh, so, Oh, I think you are on the right track. <laughs> okay, so um, another question from Z King. Artem, could you comment on the difference between being cautious and fear? Does being cautious slash careful in life also stem from fear of death? For example, I know someone who carries a gun everywhere he, he goes and he claims he's just being cautious. No, he's just being fearful. You know, if he lives in a ghetto where he uh, walks by uh, 10 uh, shootings a day, I don't, I, I don't even know if such places exist. I mean, what we call a ghetto is usually, is not like, well, yes, there's more violence going on there, but they're not usually like the places where you're going and everybody kills you right, right away. No, I mean, people live there. There's more violence, but, but they're people. So, so, uh, Unless you're in a war zone, let's put it this way, then if you carry a gun with you everywhere, you're just being fearful. And you also want to use it too. You know, and you will get into the situations. You know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's stupid. It, it's absolutely stupid. The difference between cautious and cautious, being cautious and fear is uh, internal, you know? So, uh, 
uh, and also rational. So, like for example, uh, it is, you know, uh, just one example. So, so you, you're much more highly likely to to be dead uh, in a in a traffic incident than to be to die by by gun violence. Right. So, if you took extraordinary measures uh, to prevent yourself from dying uh, in street violence, like like you go to uh, self-defense classes and you get a permit and you carry a gun everywhere. So you invest time, effort, uh, all of that, right? Money, training in order to, to make you sale, safe from this, uh, ostensibly, seemingly, right? And then you look at something else, which is much more likely to cause you death. And you ask yourself, how much time, effort, training skills did i invest in order to avoid that death and the answer is zero and you have to seriously consider you know whether you do it uh, out of fear or out of uh, some uh, unconscious attraction to violence which can be expressed and explored in any number of other ways which is much safer much safer for the public. I personally think that any person with with, with, with a gun on the street is, is dangerous to to public. Uh, uh, so it is it is uh, the being cautious is is rational. You know, uh, fear is irrational. Fear is based on beliefs that have no basis in reality. You know, like uh, for example. Some people are afraid of flying, you know. Some people would rather take a drive from San Francisco to Los Angeles, for example, uh, which is an eight-hour drive, than uh, take a one-hour flight. So if you just calculate the chances of you dying during that drive versus during a flight, they're going to be very, very low in both cases. But still, you will be hundreds, if not thousands of times less likely to die if you took the flight, you know. So fear is irrational always, and the fearful response uh, comes from, you know, how you feel inside, you know. So people who are afraid of flying, uh, it doesn't matter if you quote them this information. It is internal. They're just afraid, you know. People who are afraid of violence, who are afraid of being shot, they may have violence happen to them, you know. You know, the ego is an interesting thing because it does not recognize change circumstance. Because the image of yourself is static. Like, for example, I can tell you from my, my experience, like, I grew up in a place where there was a, a lot of violence. Uh, a lot. Uh, and I also went to Russian army where even though, I mean, where, where, where so a lot, a lot of violence, senseless, stupid uh, violence, uh, and I'm not, I'm not talking about like pretending to be violent versus enemy. I meant real violence versus each other. You know the kind of machismo type of violence, and uh, uh, the, and yes, I mean I did have a, a I, I was very much afraid of violence, and and I still hate violence. I don't want any violence in my life. But, 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 but. I had a kind of uh, uh, part of the self-image as, as a victim of, of violence, even though I wasn't, I mean, I wasn't very much victim of violence, but, but there was fear, right? And when, it's not like when I moved to a place where violence is very rare, this fear went away immediately. It took some time to recognize the change circumstance, you know. It took some time. Uh, 
So because because this this image is is static, you know. So so uh, the people who are very uh, attracted to guns, it, it's it is always connected with uh, uh, violence on, on a deep way. I mean, sometimes it's rational, but rarely, very rarely. It's usually fear, it's fear of violence, it's a fear of death, or it's an attraction to violence uh, on, on a subconscious level. Which doesn't mean that these people are dangerous, you know? Like sometimes you need a good person with a gun. There's nothing wrong with that, right? So they, it doesn't mean that they have less control over their impulses than, than you have. It, it doesn't necessarily mean that doesn't necessarily right but but if they were to go through the process of spiritual awakening that would be one of the things they would look at you know uh, so so uh, yeah um, it, it, it you know it's not going to help either of you if you're going to argue with him in, in, in a kind of a forceful way you know, but but the more authentic they are with themselves, the better, right? So a person who says, who lives in a in a in a nonviolent neighborhood and says, I'm, I carry a gun because for self protection. I mean, it's much more self deluding than a person who says, Well, I, I carry a gun because I kind of like to feel safe and I kind of like to think that when something happens, I will be able to do something. Like in the movies, you know, <laughs> you know, it's 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 much more honest, at least, you know. So uh, honesty is very important in, in this process. Okay, uh, next question, uh, Michael. I had a lot of emotion release in my first acid trip. Beautiful. A lot of tears, laughter, and <laughs> nice. And the Kundalini experience. I was easily accepting all the emotions. Wonderful. But about one hour after the trip, when I tried to meditate, there was so much resistance to fear. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, it felt like I'm not able to accept it anymore without the acid. Um, mm. It's just a fact that meditations on psychedelics are always more powerful. It can go much deeper. Well, 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 yes, but it doesn't mean that you cannot accept it without the acid. You see, it's the the process of acceptance and and the resistance that arises is the same process, right? Because for for as long as there's still something to accept, that's resistance. If there is fear, that's resistance. So, yes, I mean, yes, I mean. Any psychedelic will help you break through resistance and be more accepting. And it, it, it's not going to be very pleasant also. Yes. Uh, when you uh, lie in meditation without psychedelics and you, fe and you feel uh, a fear coming, coming up, a big fear, and you're like, oh, my God, I'm not able to accept it, that, that's, actually, that's actually good because it, it probably wouldn't uh, come up. In, in such a way, if, if you didn't have the acid trip. So actually, so it uncovered a kind of a new layer on fear, which now uh, follows you in meditation, <laughs> you see. So you will feel resistance. Of course, you will feel re re resistance, you know. So it's not like you need psychedelics to accept uh, anything. They do intensify the process of surrender. The whole life is about the process of surrender. They do intensify it in the same way that meditation is. They, they, they are more intense, yes. So they're basically kind of a forced meditation. So you can, you can go much deeper in, into uh, resistance uh, on, on a psychedelic. And afterwards, you can have a lot of you can get exposed into a lot of resistance you didn't know was there, which I think is what happened uh, to you. So, so yes, I mean, it is 
more powerful, of, of course, right? But it doesn't mean that meditation doesn't work or meditation isn't powerful. Uh, and it's not about going to some depth and then going back. It's about uh, learning to let go, learning to resist less. It's about emotional release. So uh, uh, you, you can use psychedelics to to help in meditation to to, to release more. You know, don't think about it as like going deeper. Uh, but I, I think I think you use it in in the same way uh, uh, that I do. So so I don't see a problem here. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, we have a comment from Jacqueline, Jacqueline Stover. She says, I feel I'm learning the art of not giving my soul to a loved one. OK, well, I mean, I, 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 I don't know what to say. Uh, I, if you want me to comment, I would need a little bit more detail, you know. Uh, should... OK. I would like to add Julia to the stream. Hi, Julia. Can you hear me? Hello. Julia? Yes. Hi. Hi. You're, you're live. Yes, I'm here. I've been listening for the past 20 minutes. <laughs> cool. I, I, I don't think I ever heard you speak. Uh, I did. We did chat last time, I think. Uh, but yeah. yeah, we did. Oh, we probably. Oh, OK. You, you have a... I have a camera. I can switch myself on if you want to. You have almost like a British accent or something like this. Hey, this is me. <laughs> okay. Hi, Yuli. Yes. So did you have any questions or comments or whatever it is? Uh, questions or comments? I think I missed most of the part. Uh, of the... <laughs> I'm sorry about Shame that. on you. <laughs> <gonna be excited>. <laughs> <laughs> Bad girl. <laughs> um, because, you know, I'm kind of going through this uh, stage of kind of becoming a bit disappointed in my positive kind of beliefs and views of the <laughs> <Good. laughs> <That's very good. laughs> world. That's the problem. With most yeah, people, they get very disappointed with their. Uh, no, and like that, you know, what you but they don't get to the point where they start to get disappointed <laughs> with their positive beliefs, you know, because no positive thinking is also not reality. No, I know. Yeah, so what is, you know, yeah. what what is, and it can be both positive and negative are to be transcended. You know, both positive and negative are just ways to look. Just yeah. ways to to perceive, you know, yeah. the to see things as they are. Like when you see things as they are, you cannot say if it's positive or negative. It says it says it is. Yeah, you know, it says it is. So it says good for you. It's good. Yeah. So the the fact Continue, that the, the words when you spoke earlier about you know the intellectual intellectual compassionate love was something, you know, that I've been thinking about lately, you know, as opposed to like a rational love, when you choose a partner, you know, you almost like, I don't know, have like criteria, you know, and oh, there's some kind of emotional romantic love, which is obviously short lived, and you know, it's never going to be there. So like, I'm kind of, I think I'm getting a bit disappointed. Uh, in this belief of like finding that i don't know perfect i mean it's nothing to do with self-realization you know it's not a question about it it's just something like so and in the way i always thought that you know you, there will be one person that you'll find and he'll be you know your perfect match and then there should be all this like romantic thing and he will complete you in some way right sort of yeah and now i just tend to kind of look at it as more of a well it's not a contract but it's like a rational kind of decision you know to be with someone and then it's like day-to-day -day life it's like you're working you know obviously you have an ego the other person has an ego so you need to like find a common ground and then I don't know like kind of go through all these conflicts and eventually 
reach to a level where you know you like have you know like mutual respect and deep understanding of each other and it's nothing to do with the initial you know romantic feeling that you normally would go through in the beginning of yes yes initial romantic feeling uh i, I kind of uh i kind of based on uh possession in a way but i mean the the, the, the very interesting thing about about falling in love because falling in love is great like falling in love was wonderful because uh, in in when you fall in love you let go of control and when you fall in love you see the other person through you know rose tinted glasses as if you could do no wrong and you're very forgiving and you're much less judgmental and yeah. you're kind of flying and and it's a little scary sometimes and it feels the same. it's actually a much clo it's a state which is much closer to reality than than that than most people uh, realize but uh, the romantic involvement, it usually, I mean, this honeymoon stage ends very quickly usually. And even during it, and definitely after, afterwards, there's also a, a sense of uh, deep vulnerability because it comes from the sense of possession, right? So we become very vulnerable when we fall in love uh, because uh we are uh afraid that this person who we think now is the source of our happiness will uh, bring us pain uh and that's why the process of enlightenment is very similar to the first of falling in love it's just that you're falling in love with yourself but it's also it's it's in the same way vulnerable it's in the same way painful and it's in the same way euphoric and terrifying at the same time so uh, I mean, yes, uh, on one hand, you're right, and on the other hand, you're, you're not. So uh, on one hand, yes, it is uh, uh, true that uh, kind of romantic love and infatuation uh, and all those things aren't the kind of a, a deep, cold love of, of enlightenment. But on the other hand, if you don't yourself experience deep cold love of enlightenment and you're just speaking and thinking about this intellectually, which I suspect you do because, because otherwise you probably wouldn't be here asking you these questions, right? So then it can also be a kind of a, 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 a rationalizing of love on your part, you know? Okay, well, I'll find a partner which kind of makes sense uh, to me and we will live together and be partners and work through our egos and stuff like that. Uh, yes, I mean, if you uh, are at the stage where this is, when, when, when you transcended the ego, you know, that's, that's kind of uh, uh, how, how it is, right? So you, so, so you don't suffer if somebody leaves you, right? But there's still love, you know? So, uh, but, but before that, it can be a pretense to not fall deeper in love with, with your partner, mm -hmm. to stay at this kind of a rational, uh, uh, practical kind of level, you know, not to to work around your egos instead of dissolve your egos into each other, instead of falling into each other, dissolving into each other in love, you know? So for as long as you're capable to love in, in, in any way, you know, in, in egoic sense, it doesn't matter. Uh, don't be afraid to love. Because in love, we, we grow. In love, we learn to forgive. In, in love, we learn not to judge. In love, we learn to understand. You know, and if you do not have this feeling for a partner that I just love him, you know, I, I, I can't explain how. I can't explain why love is, is not cannot be explained. You know, existence cannot be explained. But isn't you know. love just some kind of chemical reaction in your body? You have like, you know, uh, so <laughs> 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 well, you got an, an object, you know, and you have a nice conversation and and whatever else. <laughs> and then you just have this chemical you know disbalance in your bloodstream and then you're in love you know <laughs> and then and then you just 
you know, it feels, yeah, it feels great. And, uh, and then it's like, it's an emotion, no? and it kind of goes away and, and then you kind of try and chase it. And, I think you're speaking about romantic infatuation. Oh yeah, fine, yes, I think you're right. Which, which, which is kind of, yes, yes. But, but I mean, uh, you know, it doesn't matter, right? Is it like, similar yes, to falling in love? Isn't it the same process? You fall in love with someone and that person is, you know, always on your mind and then, you know, you have... So it's not... I think yes, so that's an infatuation, mm -hmm. right? That's, that's, that's not love, right? So, I mean, yeah, I mean, this is what is oftentimes, you, you know, when... Uh, uh, but But you see... Even infatuation isn't bad. I mean, I would never say, don't do that to you, you know, because, because you see, uh, it, it is obsessive, yes, in the way that it's possessive. But at the same time, uh, let's say like you're just, you know, a normal kind of office girl and you walk around and you do your job and then you meet a guy and then boom, he's the only one you can think about. Now he's the only one you can think about. Or you think about him all the time. I mean, what does it mean? I mean, it means that right now there's nothing else that you want to do than to be with this person and enjoy this person as much as you can, right? But at the same time, you have like friends, work, career, all the other things that is very, very important to you, right? And there is a, an enormous conflict, you know? So if you can, when you fall in love, you can, if you can just, you know, be with this person as much as you can, and you can enjoy each other as much as you can, this is great. I mean, good for you. Yes, the spirit will pass because, because it is scary to fall in love. When you fall in love, when you really fall in love, it feels like the ground is taken off your feet. And it doesn't matter if you fall in love in, in, in another person or if you fall in love in, 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 your, in yourself. Because you learn to do what it is you really want without thinking about what, what, what other people want. And if you want this person, if you want to spend time with them, that's what you want. And and you can over overlook things that, Sometimes, oh, he 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 has this uh, problem and, and, and this problem and he's not good enough here and he's not good enough here. Because so when this initial uh, rush of hormones, which is it's just a rush of love, uh, it, it manifests in the, in the brain. Like if you open the brain, yeah, you'll see like some hormones measure it. Okay, what, what does it, does it mean? It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean anything. I mean, did you fall in love because the hormones flooded your brain? I mean, or did the hormones flooded your brain because you fell in love? Okay, so if the hormones flooded your brain because you fell in love, then why did you fall in love? Or if you fell in love because the hormones flooded the brain, then why did they flood your brain? I mean, you, you, you can go like this forever. Yeah. You know? And it doesn't matter what you put in front of what. You know? But when this initial wave of love when you feel like you, you're losing control. Mm. And that's why it can be scary. When this initial wave is gone, then the ego comes back and it and it starts to be unhappy again. I mean, oh, no, no, no. I mean, this is, is irritates me here and he's very, and, and I can't spend much time with him. And I need to distract myself from all of this discontent. Uh, I need some time for myself and, and, and think that it's very hard to fall in, 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 in love with another person so deeply that you can you start to solve your ego in it. And the same thing as falling in love with yourself, right? So don't be afraid to love, you know? And the deep love is not the romantic infatuation, right? It's, it's different, you know? The deep love is... Uh, acceptance, non 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 judgment. And when you when you love somebody, you just know that you love somebody. It's not like I love my wife. I do. But deep love takes time, right? It's not like you can love someone. I don't know. A week after you met them. 
well, I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. It's 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 so. So there are different kind of love is such an overloaded word, right? I mean, it's it's such a it's a term that is so poorly understood. And as you go deeper and deeper into the spiritual journey, you understand love in a very very different way. Hmm. But yes, I mean, there is a romantic infatuation that that can be oftentimes about. Uh, possession, hope that this person will make you happy, self-image, or if only I can get this person, I, I would like. How do? How would you look at yourself after that? How would society look at you after that? All of these things, right? And there's a there's a deeper, intimate love, which is kind of uh, almost more like a family love. And you're right, this this love takes time. This love is is based on intimacy, intimacy and acceptance. The more you get to know another person, the more he gets to know you, the more you get to know each other, don't judge each other, understand each other, right? And yes, I mean, you can still get irritated by each other, all these things, right? But the more you're willing to forgive each other, it is always based on intimacy, which is why uh, kind of in a relationship, there is oftentimes this period uh, and, and people who studied love from the scientific perspective pointed this out, it can be seen in statistics like five or six years after the relationship start, there's a very big chance of it breaking up because the romantic love, the infatuation, the possessive love is no longer there. You know, whatever you thought, like if you thought this person would make you happy, that already kind of, it's not applicable anymore. Well, maybe he did for a while, but now you're back to your regular self. It's okay, it's not there anymore. Mm -hmm. Right, so there's nothing that really pulls you in all the time, right? And and now you're just living with a person who sometimes irritates you and who you hate sometimes and who sometimes you can't spend a long time with and who sometimes you need some rest from, you know, because you're unaccepting of them in the same way that you're unaccepting of yourself. Uh, so, and so after like five or six years, uh, or four or something like this. So this romantic pool is no longer there, but the intimate, deep, uh, kind of uh, familial love hasn't developed yet. It's not enough time, you know? So so it's a, it's a dangerous period in any relationship. And, and uh, so yes, this sort of love takes time, right? But just, just as uh, the same kind of love to yourself takes time, right? So the more forgiving you are of yourself, the more forgiving you are of others, right? So so the the deep, the deepest existential love, the cold love of a Buddha, as we spoke about earlier, it doesn't take time at all. Right? But you cannot say, well, okay, I'm gonna look at uh, my relationship rationally now. And yeah, we have egos, we'll work it and pretend that you are doing this kind of love. Right. So develop intimate uh, uh, love for your partner. You know, grow in that love. Grow in your love for yourself. Grow together in that love. Dissolve into that love together. You know. So uh, so even though, like, so it seems like your question was a little bit of mimicry. You see. <laughs> <laughs> I had a conversation today with a friend of mine and he's convinced that it should be the the rational approach is the approach you know the, the and which sort of resembles the the what you say is intellectual compassionate love but it's in his description it was something different so it was more like practical approach to relationship knowing that you know that uh initial kind of sparkle would go away sooner or later and then you'll be left with the you know practicalities of the life and then you know two egos and then you know you'll just have to manage that but obviously what you explain is something yeah you, you know, it, it's deeper. I mean, I mean, yes, yeah. it, it is paradoxical in a way because yes, I can say that a, an enlightened state is absolutely rational, but but the egoic state is not. Mm. And 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 unless you are willing to go through 
the pains and sorrows of growing in love, of, uh, you know, uh, seeking pleasant experiences, of getting them, not being satisfied, then uh, looking at your own pain and tears and fear, unless you're willing to live with your full intensity, you will never understand enlightenment, you see? You see? Yeah. Because, because, you know, it is when someone dies, let's say, and you want to cry, you can say, well, yeah, sure, what's the point of crying? It's not going to bring it back. I'll go and watch a movie to distract myself, you see. But you will be carrying so much tears inside. You need to cry until you can't anymore. So it's the same with love. Mm. You see? You see? Yes, I mean, I can say, well, when somebody says, well, yes, death is a part of life, right? But I deeply accepted it and I cried my tears about it. I might still cry. But to pretend to use rationality for disallowing yourself your pain, for disallowing yourself your pure, for disallowing yourself your love, for disallowing yourself your yearning, for disallowing yourself to live fully, intensely, you know, passionately, then you will always live half-heartedly. You see? So you need to open yourself up to all that comes in life. You see? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, Jacqueline says a lot of things. <laughs> what, what if you're not good enough? I know, sorry. Okay, I don't know what's going on in my comment section. I hope that next time Jacqueline Stover would be able to join live and then we can speak to her. Uh, let's see if we have any other guests. Well, yeah, it's been a, a one hour, 40 minutes and uh, I, uh, I, I, th I think uh, I'm about to wrap it up. I think it's, it's a good time. Thank you very much for, for joining. Uh, for watching, uh, you're welcome. Yeah, I do really much hope that it was useful for you. So if it, uh, you know, if you have any comments, uh, send it to me. Oh, I have a, a couple of things in the private chat. Tyler says, how often do you do these streams? Yeah, I plan to do this like every few weeks or something. So. I also do um, uh, real life gathering in, in Redwood City, California, on the set songs kind of thing. So uh, yeah, um, feel free to uh, follow me on Facebook, YouTube. I have a website too. Uh, there's a, a chat community also. So yes, there's a lot of material, a lot of support and people who are also going through this thing and struggle with their own stuff. Yes, everybody struggles on the path. That's entirely normal. I struggle this fuck. So uh, Z King says, thank you. You're welcome. All right, well, thank you very much, guys. Thank you for joining. You all have a wonderful day. Bye. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye, 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 bye.